So the news is out and it's bad. It's unfortunate. But perhaps we all should have seen it coming. Formula One has lost its goat. He's lost his drive and will no longer be on the grid. Nicholas Latifi is no longer a Formula One driver. Like I said, perhaps not all that surprising. I mean, the results weren't really there and was the butt of many jokes for his entire time in the game, never taken seriously, even by his own car at times. But all of this is a tad confusing. I mean, after all, didn't he have a successful junior career before reaching Formula One? He was vice champion in Formula Two after all. Well. Yes, he was, but there is a bit of an asterisk attached to that, because preceding that, there was no suggestion whatsoever that this man who we would come to know as Gotifi was going to shake stuff up, and anyone who did was either lying or trying not to lose a follow on their Insta. And nah, I don't think I'm being unfair, because after having a moderately decent karting career, Latifi decided that the best way to step up into motorsport back in 2012 was to throw himself into the deep end. He'd make his car racing debut in Formula 3. Now, this can work. We've seen it with the likes of Max Verstappen. That dude was a frontrunner in his debut year in one of the toughest junior series in the world, thus proving that it's definitely possible. But for Latifi, it... Well, it wasn't. And unlike Verstappen, Latifi wasn't in the European F3 series. He was in the Italian one. And that series, like most things made in Italy, was great until it started to break down in a lake of its own oil. Latifi finished that first round well by finishing last in the standings. However, a change in teams midway through the season brought about better fortunes. He got his first win in the final race at Balalunga and would notch up three more podiums besides that. Doubtless pleased with himself by finishing seventh in a dead championship, Latifi decided that for 2013, he would do everything. British F3, European F3, Masters of F3, and most importantly, the Toyota Racing Series. Why was this important? Well, like they say, breakfast is the most important meal of the day, and the Winter Series is the most important championship of the motor racing year. I mean that, and I'm a series ambassador. However, while I can advocate for what is now known as the Castrol Toyota Formula Regional Oceana Championship of the longest freaking name ever, I could not do the same for Latifi's driving because he finished behind all of his teammates and back in Europe, it wasn't much better, only ever having the upper hand on Jan Mardenborough. The others though? There was still a ways ahead. Driving under the guise of Trevor Carlin, one couldn't make too many excuses about the team, but that didn't stop the King from upgrading his subscription for 2014. He would stay in European F3, only this time he would be with Prima. Alongside that, he competed in the Macau Grand Prix, made one-off appearances in the World Series by Renault, Porsche Carrera Cup UK, GP2 Series, and competed in Lawrence Stroll's Formula A Bath Florida Beach Party at the beginning of the year. You see, that's the thing. We wonder about how Latifi even got into Formula 1 in the first place, given the results, whatever they were, that we have seen thus far. In the end, it came down to the money of this man, Michael Latifi. I don't know if he knew it then, but the fortune this guy amassed by selling salami and chicken nuggets would put the goat onto the grand stage of Formula One. Keep that in mind, by the way. All those people that cooked up some chicken nuggies at 3 a.m. after a night on the piss, in other words, all of us, are partially responsible for paving the way for this man to get into Formula One. So is that inadvertent crowdfunding? Is that how this works? We all need someone like Michael Latifi in our lives. I mean, at least someone with vast wealth to help us all chase our dreams. Who would be my Michael Latifi? Well, it would have to be Surfshark, although they haven't given me an F1 seat yet. I'm still holding our hope though, because they are decent people. They do, after all, offer a VPN service that encrypts all the data that you send through the internet, protecting said data and keeping any marvices from getting at it. But Surfshark, well, they're not a one-trick pony. We aren't, after all, talking about Gunter Steiner here. So we all love streaming. I mean, the new Last of Us TV show is out now, and we don't want to miss that, do we? Especially if, wherever you are, it's restricted. Well, with Surfshark, you can change your location by passing said restrictions, thereby allowing you access to your favorite content and can also be a vital tool for those to live in countries that like to censor their people for whatever their reasons may be. And hey, I'll give you an opportunity to say it along with me. It ain't quite teleportation, but it is about as close as we're going to get right now. So by using my link in the description and using the promo code Josh Rebel, you can get Surfshark VPN for 83% off and three extra months for free. That amounts to around about a couple of bucks a month for virtual protection, as well as three free months and a 30 day money back guarantee as well. So what the bloody hell are you waiting for? I know what I'm waiting for. That Formula 1 seat. But seeing as how inflation has bowled us all over, I guess we can go back to talking about the GOAT instead. So, he had that Prima drive. No excuses. Theoretically speaking, his only problem was that his teammates included Antonio Fuoco and Esteban Ocon. Fuoco finished the year in P5 with a pair of wins to his credit, whilst Ocon won the whole damn thing, beating the likes of Tom Blomqvist and Max Verstappen to the title. 
Latifi, meanwhile, he was languishing down in P10, with the opening round on Silverson proving that he could drive, and the rest of the championship proving that he couldn't. Or perhaps, Ocon just set the bar and made Latifi look bad, because in those other events that I talked about, those one-offs, he didn't look bad at all. There was Macau, first time there. He outqualifies Fuoco and finishes the Grand Prix in P5. The first lap chaos had a hand in that, but as they say, you can't win a race unless you finish it. In the World Series, he went in with no official testing of the car, but by the end of the half season, he was on the podium. In the Porsche Carrera Cup, he was immediately on the pace and qualified second for his debut race. In GP2, he outpaced his teammate on debut, and in Florida, he completely embarrassed Big Daddy by being the best performing Canadian on campus, picking up four wins, equaling Fuoco for the most in that series, and also finished ahead of Max Verstappen in the standings, which was amazing if it actually counted toward an actual championship but it wasn't and it didn't so it's all a bit meaningless but at the very least we do have context around all of this forgetting the main european championship latifi was indeed impressive relatively speaking but we still have a couple more years more than that actually before he made it to the big time for 2015 he elected to compete full-time in the world series fair enough given how decent he was at the end of last year he would be racing at arden alongside igor orutsev and was hoping to mount a challenge for the title Unfortunately, all that momentum he had last year did not math into this one. Aside from a couple decent performances, particularly at Spa, he was drowning in the mid-pack, or in some cases, flying through it. His teammate Arutsev was absolutely no slouch, and a half season in UK Porsches was just as lit warm. There were two interesting things to take from that year, however. There was another winter series in America, the Pro Master Winterfest. The results weren't particularly amazing, with the podiums he acquired balanced out by being a second off the leader's pace. Although this participation was an indication that maybe he was looking at a career in IndyCar. Well, if that was the case, his increased interest in GP2 did not make any sense. MP Motorsport had bought Sergio Kinemassas on board for 2015. However, doubtless bored with the repair bills, he was replaced for the remaining rounds. One of those drivers was Latifi, who commandeered the car for the remaining rounds, with his teammates being Daniel De Jong and Rene Binder. Ooh, scary. Trying to beat them too? Not the hardest task in the world. Thus, he beat them, and GP2 would be where he would hang his hat for the next few years. In particular, he would be with the Dams team, who were a Dams good outfit. Got him. They would give him a good shot at that title, so there weren't a million excuses to be had. Running concurrently with all of this, he'd dip his toe into the grossly unfair pseudo-sport known as Formula One, forming ties with Renault, who had also signed Jolly and Palmer into their team in an attempt to assert themselves as frontrunners in the Battle of the Mid. He'd gained time in a Formula One car throughout that year, but the main priority lay with GP2. His teammate, Alex Lynn, was the benchmark, and I know what you're thinking. He couldn't live with them, and if you were to look at the overall standings, you might have a point there. But he did keep within touching distance a lot of the time in terms of pace. He wasn't necessarily a pushover. That said, however, coulda, woulda, shouldas are cheap in the sport. Taking it at face value, he was way down on his teammate in the points. His teammate scored three wins that season, whilst Latifi barely scored points. And in this game, your teammate is the only real competition that you have. Next year had to be better, but considering his teammate would be Ollie Rowland, this wasn't going to be easy. Outperforming him on diet wasn't going to be too difficult, but Rowland's prowess lay on the racetrack, and he proved that by being a constant presence on that podium, finishing third in the standings behind only Artem. Markelov and Charles Leclerc. Where was Latifi in all of that? He actually wasn't too far away, finishing P5 and merely 13 points away from Roland. That was not bad at all. He also secured his maiden win at Silverstone and was on the podium constantly. Things were looking on the up. For ooh, it must have been 23 minutes. For 2018, he would be joined by Alex Albon. And while Albon were completely run away in the standings, the King very slowly began to get to grips with the new F2 car, which was quickly proving to be one of the most unreliable pieces of garbage that the motor racing world had ever seen. In two of the last three rounds, Latifi outqualified Albon. But overall, it was a somewhat difficult year. 2019. And by now, Latifi had been competing in Formula 2 in some capacity since 2014. But he'd also been preparing for a tilt at Formula Formula 1. After leaving Renault, he was named as Force India's test and reserve driver for 2018. He'd made his Grand Prix weekend debut at Montreal, driving an FP1, and would drive in a further four more FP1 sessions for the remainder of the year. Fast forward two or three months later, and Latifi would leave Force India, now pitching camp at the Williams team, who had just recruited Formula 2 champion George Russell and 
motor racing legend, Robert Kubica. But they were now desperately in need of subsidizing their lost Canadian money with even more Canadian money. Latifi's testing schedule at Williams was more thorough than it had been at either Renault or Force India. But if Latifi were to get to Formula One, he needed that dreaded FIA super license. And despite seeing that this dude was not really being left in the dust, he did need a big year to secure the points required. He knew he had the team to do it, but now it was up to him. By the end of the third round in Spain, we were left with a truly horrifying sight. Latifi was leading the championship, and by decent margin too. He had won half of the races up to that point. He couldn't have started that season any better. However, he completely lost that momentum for the remainder of the year. Only one more win came in Hungary, and there were two rounds where he didn't score any points at all, in Monaco and in Monza. But you want to know who did score points in Monza. But while the rest of the season was not particularly amazing, he did finish every race. And even though not all of them resulted in points, other drivers' failures to do so meant that he just managed to stay ahead of Luca Giotto and teammate Sergio Seta Camera to take P2 in the championship. This locked in 40 super license points and effectively secured him a spot on the Formula 1 grid. So can we call this a successful junior career? Well, depends upon your perspective. If you're someone who believes that junior spec series racing is entirely equal and not unfair at all, and that stats mean everything, and that unless you win 25 out of a possible 7 races in a season, it's not good enough, then no, it wasn't great. In reality, it wasn't the worst career that it has ever been, but it was nowhere near as bad as what some people pretended it was. But whether people thought it was good or not, it didn't change the scenario that Latifi was Formula One bound. In November 2019, he would be announced to drive at Williams for 2020, full time, alongside George Russell. And so now, we've come to this. The big time. From 2020 onwards, he was going to be a Formula One driver. And immediately, no one gave him a chance. He hadn't even gotten to round one yet, and people were acting as though they'd just cast Rudy Giuliani as the next James Bond. God forbid we should give a Formula One driver time to prove their worth. I must admit though, crashing in FP3 wasn't exactly helpful, and qualifying nearly 17th slower than his teammate George seemed to confirm everyone's worst fears. That oh dear, here comes another pay driver. Although to those people, I'll just ask one thing. Name me one year where there was not a single pay driver or rich playboy running around on that Formula 1 grid. Good luck finding it, because it never happened. They've always been around. The sport was built upon that, and they're always going to be around. In the race, however, we saw something astonishing. He started the race in P20, aka last, but he started to move up the field. He was in 19th place, then 18th, and then 17th, 16th, 15th, 14th. This was astonishing progress up the field. Granted, everyone else around him was dying, but as they say, you can't win a race unless you finish it. He finished his debut race in P11, which was great, but the euphoria would not last long. The reality was that he was in a Williams, and Williams were not the same team that absolutely monstered Formula 1 back in the 80s and 90s. These were different times. They were foraging for scraps. In Hungary, he reached Q2 for the first time ever, but he was still nearly a second down on his teammate. During the race, in tricky conditions, he spun about 1,200 times, which is generally thought to be about 1,100 times too many, and as a result, he was lapped. Which, big deal. Almost everyone was lapped. But with Latifi, it wasn't once. It wasn't twice. It wasn't even thrice. He was lapped five times. That was an excessive amount. The first Silverstone round brought some joy, with the big selling point being an overtake during the race. An overtake. A single overtake. Thereafter, it was a relatively quiet season. Granted, one couldn't do too much with that Williams, but he was barely keeping sight of George either. What was needed was a stroke of dumb luck, and Monza provided that. Thanks to some red flags and pit stop malarkey, he was at one point running in ninth position. This, along with the Williams being half decent and straight line speed, could have presented points for him. But unfortunately, they don't do points for 11th place, which is where he ended up. But at least in the next round in Magello, he did get closer to Jesus. Or rather, Jesus got closer to him. He continued to struggle that year, buoyed only by his Imola performance, where he finished in P11 again, taking advantage of a massive bottle by his own teammate. The only consistency from this season came in the form of spins, which, while spectacular, does have an adverse effect on overall lap time. Honestly though, this sort of stuff should be expected of rookies. Mistakes happen, for sure. However, he did need to up his pace. At no point did he outqualify his teammate, and there were some races where he absolutely failed to keep pace in the race. especially 
especially when there was water on the track, such as in Hungary and Turkey. In fairness though, you do have to give a driver one year to develop, and then another year to finally prove themselves. Judging a driver in their first year, especially if they don't have the car with them, is not a fair thing. There's limited testing nowadays. It is harder for a rookie to break into the category, but according to that theory, 2021 should have been the year where he would come out and prove his worth to the world. If that was his plan, slamming into the barriers at the second round at Imola probably did not help. He did bridge the gap a little bit pace-wise, but he continued to have lonely races where if it weren't for him being lapped, you'd probably forget he was racing at all. There was nothing inherently wrong with how he was driving, but there wasn't anything either that was jumping out as a breakthrough drive. His teammate, meanwhile, was garnering all the applause, and rightly so. In the Belgian Grand Prix, Latifi qualified in P12, commendable for sure, but George was on the front row and very nearly took the pole in a freaking Williams. He got a point for his efforts after some post-qualifying penalties were put in place, but that really wasn't much to write home about, partially because that race wasn't a race, and partially because that wasn't even the highlight for him that year. For in the round prior, he capitalized on a first corner plane crash. Thanks to some tomfoolery by Bottas and Sir Lancelot, as well as strategic master strokes from the Silver Arrows, Latifi was running around in third position for the opening portion of the race, which proved two things. Firstly, that the Hungara ring is rubbish for modern day Formula 1 cars, and that Latifi was competent enough when given clean air in a car that didn't try to kill him. Remember, this was the track where, just 12 months prior, he was spinning like a dreidel and was lapped five times. I guess one can call it progress? Well, as quickly as that progress went, it started to fade away again. Sure, he began to out-qualify George and broke the streak that bought him the name Mr. Saturday, but he also maintained his knack for spinning off the road, an activity which doesn't assist in garnering points. Some of these came in time for qualifying, which left him buried down the order, and when you're down there, it's easy for more mistakes to occur, and you can be as fast as you want, but as we already now know, you can't win a race unless you finish it. Some elements were beyond his control, for sure, but mistakes were hampering his progress. These were getting more noticeable as the season drew to a close, including an attempt to provoke a Canadian civil war, and in the final round at Abu Dhabi, it would affect him more than he could ever imagine. These images are etched into the mind of everyone who watched that race that night and not in a good way. A truly unbelievable title battle between two indescribably amazing drivers ruined. And this crash was the catalyst. There's a lot that could be said about that night, but for now, we're focused on Latifi's story. It was not a hard corner to lose the car on, and he was not the only one to do it that weekend. There was certainly no malice involved, but some thought it was deliberate, and pretty soon thereafter, the abuse came in. Under any circumstances, this sh is not on. For some people, they need to hear the words, practice what you preach. We should never give drivers sh We should never tease them whenever they make a mistake. We should never behave like me. But the only good thing to take out of this was that the people that mattered were in Latifi's corner. Most notably, Sir Lewis. It almost certainly played in his mind though. It almost certainly rattled his confidence. From the start of 2022, his new teammate, Alex Albon, a reunion of the 2018 Dam's dream team, had the measure of him. Clearly. In Saudi Arabia, he crashed twice over the weekend. In Melbourne, he collided with Sir Lancelot. In Monaco, he was accused of costing Carlos Sainz his maiden Grand Prix win after becoming colorblind when the blue flags came out. And his general performances whenever he wasn't sparing backwards toward a barrier made for grim reading. Confidence in himself was certainly shot, but whether it was down to what happened in Abu Dhabi or his steady pace at getting to grips with the new regulations and the new car, it didn't matter. This sport does not wait for you. He needed to sort this out fast because even with the vast money behind him, his seat was in question, especially given that Williams didn't really need that cash anymore. Rumour had it that he was to be replaced from the British Grand Prix onwards by Oscar Piastri. This never happened though, Williams electing to stick it out with Latifi until the end of the year, and it's just as well they did, because at the British Grand Prix, he shocked the motor racing world by dragging his Williams into Q3, in a barnstorming performance that saw him line up on P10 on that grid, and he capitalised on this masterful performance by missing out on points in a chaotic race, his efforts curtailed by floor damage. Among other things, he suffered floor damage again in Austria, and had a late race tango with Kevin Magnussen in France. It seemed he couldn't catch a break, until Hungary came again. And in qualifying, we were treated with a truly awe-inspiring sight. Fastest in Sector 1, personal best in Sector 2, he came across the line to finish his lap and stun the paddock by finishing last. Compared with what happened in Belgium though, that was nothing. And by now, the contrast between he and Albon was apparent. 
just like it was with Russell. Thus, it was becoming a bit more clear as to whether he should remain in the category. And so, with great prospects in Formula 2 and the like knocking on his door for a Formula 1 seat, Williams set Latifi an ultimatum. You need to deliver consistently. And hey, to be fair, Latifi at that point was consistent. Lee out of the points. In terms of damaging one's reputation, Monza seemed to be the fatal blow. After Albon was sidelined with appendicitis, Nick De Vries was drafted in to fill the void. De Vries made it to Q2, Latifi didn't. De Vries finished in the points, Latifi did not. De Vries got driver of the day, and Latifi got syphilis. Only one of those was actually true, but on paper, this was still awful for Latifi. It seemed clear-cut proof that this dude was not meant for the Formula 1 grid, that there were others out there more deserving of that seat, and that this weekend had literally proven that. And for Williams, this was the final straw. I mean, finally. At the end of 2022, he would be leaving the Williams team. What was needed at this point was a clean sheet until the end of the year, so that he could help his cause to get back onto that grid for 2023. The next round in Singapore didn't help this cause after renting a spatial awareness from Lance Stroll, and was duly rewarded with a five-place grid drop for the next round. So with the rain falling upon the Suzuka circuit, it was decided to opt for an alternative strategy, because why the hell not? Well, it worked. He was climbing and climbing and climbing up the order. He held on just enough to capture his first points of the season and greatly helped his cause in the championship, jumping from 21st in the standings to 20th. As far as positives go, however, this was pretty much the last of it that year. His race in Austin was a disaster. Brazil and Mexico weren't much better. And in Abu Dhabi, he was sent into a spin by Mick Schumacher and gave PTSD to all those who watched it. And so, with three seasons of Formula 1 to his name, and a grand total of nine points to his credit, Nicholas Latifi was no longer a Formula 1 driver. And now we're left pondering how it all went wrong for him. What happened to him? Well, I can answer that for you. Nothing. This really should not have been much of a surprise. And in the end, this all correlates to his time in junior Formula Racing. Some somewhat decent results all round, with a sprinkling of some actually good results here and there. But he was never in the league of the genuine prodigies that came along in that time. He never particularly stood out. He lacked an X factor in his drives. That's not necessarily a criticism of him, Okay, maybe it is, but it's more an indicator that yes, driving talent does still matter in Formula 1 nowadays, even if the car accounts for 80% of it. His time in Formula 1 has come and gone. His replacement, Logan Sargent, is certainly more worthy of being in that seat than he when it comes to ability behind the wheel. But there is that intangible quality to a driver that you just can't get by setting lap records and winning world championships. It's an aura that can't be taught, something that is sorely lacking in most nowadays. It's hard to describe, but whatever it is, Latifi had it in lumps. Perhaps it was his futile effort to lift himself off the back row of the grid, his violent tendency as a Canadian to apologize, or maybe it was his high intake of Nutella. Who knows? What is known is that Formula 1 has lost its goat, and while the grid is a bit more talented now that he's gone, it's somehow much worse off without him.